Apologies for that um, echoing. We're gonna get started in a few minutes. Please enter your name in the chat if you haven't already done so, if you feel comfortable to introduce yourself and your name and your pronouns. If you haven't done so already, please take the pre-course survey. If you have any questions throughout, um, please put them in the chat and we'll keep track of them. At the end, we'll have some time for questions. Um, just in general, if you see here on the screen, there's opportunity to listen in Spanish or English. Uh, here are the instructions on how to do that. Um, if you're on a tablet or phone, um, you would click on the three dots, click on language interpretation, select language, hit done. If you're on a computer, click the globe and select your preferred language. I wanted to introduce Silvia again. Silvia is, is, is Garcega, is an anthropologist, researcher, interpreter, translator. She's been working with UIC for almost 10 years. We're pleased to have her during this session for interpretation. Um, not all sessions will have, not all action labs will have live interpretations. Next, um, so just keep that in mind, but we will try our best to make sure that the information is in two languages. Thanks again to everyone here. Um, just a reminder to introduce yourself if you haven't done so. If you feel comfortable, I'll list your name and pronouns, please do so. Today we're we'll having an action lab uh, presented to you from RPH. Gracias por estar aquí hoy. Vamos a tener un laboratorio de acción con los estudiantes de salud pública radical. Uh, recuerdo que sí hay esto en español. Si se mete al canal de español, ahí va a poder escuchar la interpretación de Silvia. Este uh, laboratorio de acción va a ser traducido, pero en el futuro no va a haber. Nada más para acordarles, pero vamos a hacer lo mejor que podamos para darles esa oportunidad para tenerlo en dos idiomas. Aquí es como pueden um, cambiar el canal a español. Y otra vez, bienvenidos a todos. Por favor, si no han llenado el, um, la encuesta de, del curso, por favor, llenenla. Y si tienen algunas preguntas, ponlas en el chat. Y si se quieren introducir, también se pueden introducir en el chat. Gracias. And just a reminder, um, the live interpretation will not be happening during Action Labs. Next week, there is Spanish interpretation for the lecture with Dr. Stovall. Epidemics of Injustice was developed through a collaboration between members of Radical Public Health, RPH, UIC School of Public Health, graduate students and faculty who were brought together in 2017 by a sense of urgency to address ongoing threats to democracy, social justice, and the public's health. Through guest lectures and action labs, students will learn from others' experiences and workshop tangible skills that will prepare them to engage in action and advocacy with others across disciplines and sectors. We encourage you to visit our site to learn more about the course and stay up to date with anything um, that we list there. And in the chat, Katie's mentioned that you can access course readings, lecture slides, and other things through that site. Just a reminder that on this QR code and on our site, you will find our land acknowledgement. We would like that to kind of um, be uh, true throughout the, the classes that we do present that landing knowledge because of time we won't be able to today um, but just know that that is like the pretense of, of this work um, there's content warning that at times lectures may contain material that it's difficult to discuss 
tighten, um, create stress or have ongoing trauma with some of the situations that we describe in our own everyday lives. So if you need to, please step away and take care of yourself at any time during the presentation or lecture. We also are invested in language justice and through that we have live language interpretation. If there's another language that you all think is important to um, consider, please let us know, send us an email, send us something in the chat. And also considering that um, there's a Zoom control, so just mind mindfully be on mute. Um, please mind the chat. Um, and we're, we have many of us that are looking for your questions and anything else so that we can attend to your needs as we're upcoming in the class. And lastly, I wanted to highlight the class website. Uh, the site is updated frequently, so please check it often. Um, here we have the cash class schedules, resources, lecture slides, uh, class recordings, and anything else related to course content. Um, so here at the QR code, you'll find that site. And um, there is an opportunity to use, sorry. Um, so for today's session, we are happy to introduce Radical Public Health. They have been part of all facets of bringing this material and this course together. So Radical Public Health is an association of students, alumni, faculty, staff, and community members that seeks to address the systematic, systemic underlying causes of public health challenges and to consider more radical solutions. Please join us and please welcome them today uh, for the class. Thank you. Thanks so much, Yvette. I'm gonna get my slides up whenever. Okay, great. Okay, here we go. Um, so thank you so much for the warm welcome. My name is Marjorie and I use she, her pronouns. I'm a second year PhD student in the School of Public Health at UIC and I've been a member of Radical Public Health for about three and a half years now. And I'm really excited to be joined by some other Radical Public Health facilitators to guide you in an action lab of root cause analysis and creating and using a shared dictionary. So I'm going to leave space for some of my other radical public health comrades to introduce themselves really quickly, and then we'll dive into the rest of the action lab. Thanks, Marjorie. I can go next. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie Salgado. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am an alum of the UAC School of Public Health, um, and I've been um, active with RPH for about three years now as well. Um, and then during the day, I work at the Chicago Department of Public Health. Um, and so I will pass it to Allison. Sure. Uh, my name is Allison. I also use she, her pronouns, and I'm also an alum of UIC SPH. I graduated last spring. Um, and I've been involved with RPH since fall of 2021, so coming up on three years. Okay, Emily. I know we have, like Yvette said, a lot of people who plan this class are in RPH, so I don't know if Emily and Katie also want to introduce themselves as in this section. Sure. Hi, y'all. My name is Emily Etzkorn. Um, my pronouns are she, hers. I'm an alumni of the MPH program at UIC, um, and now I'm with staff at UIC uh, doing program management on a bunch of different initiatives. So happy to be here. Thanks. And I'm Katie. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I've been in RPH for about a year and a half now. I'll pass it back to Marjorie. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone for introducing yourselves. And now we'll dive into the rest of the content. So I just wanted to provide a quick overview of what you can expect in the Action Lab. So Yvette did a short overview of RPH, but we wanted to share a bit more about RPH with you all just so you can get a sense of who we are as a group. 
And then Stephanie will be doing an introduction to root cause analysis and sort of helping you get oriented so that you can complete your own RCA in small groups. And then we'll be doing a short report back in reflection led by Allison. And then um, Katie will be introducing our shared dictionary. So a brief introduction to our PH at UIC. So before I dive in, I did want to share our community guidelines. So these are guidelines that we co-created as a group, and we use these at our meetings and events. And so since we're here today facilitating this action lab, we wanted to introduce you all to these and invite you to use these as we're in community with you today. So the first is to assume positive intention and take responsibility for impact. The second is to step up and step back and be aware of how you take up space. The third is aim for get go, good enough to go, not perfection. And along with that, we can create and use a parking lot in our notes for things that may need to sort of be addressed at another time. We also want to speak from our own experience and use I statements. And we listen to understand not to react. So again, please join us in adhering and using these community guidelines today and moving forward, I would suggest as well. So I wanted to start by sharing this guiding quote from Ella Baker. I'm not going to read it because Stephanie is going to dive more into this as she introduces the root cause analysis, but I did want to introduce it in this portion of the slides because this quote is really important to RPH. It drives and guides how we think about the work that we do and how we think about public health. So putting it up here, hopefully you'll get a chance to read it now or when it's on the slides again when Stephanie shares it. And Yvette did read part of our mission, so I'm not going to read that again. Um, it's on the slide for you to read if you'd like to reread it. But I do want to share some of the bullet points below this that tie into our mission. So in alignment with our mission, we create a forum and supportive environment for radical perspectives at UIC, including within the School of Public Health. We enhance collaboration and build solidarity with faculty, other schools within UIC, community organizations, and movements that share our values. And we maintain a non-hierarchical or egalitarian internal structure that is in alignment with our values. And we normalize radical perspectives within learning, research, and practice within the public health community. So a bit about sort of like how we're organized internally. Um, again, the top bullet point lists who can be part of RPH. The, in a nutshell, anyone can be. So if you're interested after this action lab and joining us, I encourage you to send an email. We'll share our contact information on the last slide. We'd love to have you. Um, again, we are non-hierarchical in structure, so that means we don't have like a standard president, vice president, that type of structure. Instead, we encourage facilitators, which is our word for members, to take on sort of discrete leadership roles, such as um, creating meeting agendas. We have rotating facilitator roles for our meetings that we invite folks to sign up for. We have someone who you know, sort of leads our outreach and takes on managing our merchandise. So everyone who's able to sort of takes on smaller leadership roles and we make decisions together through collective decision-making processes. And then sort of in line with those smaller leadership roles, we encourage people to step up and take on those roles when they're able to. And then when their plate is really full, maybe stepping back to allow space for someone else to take on one of those roles. And then communication is really critical to our work. So we regularly communicate virtually via listservs and our group chat. We also have committee meetings that are organized around the priorities we've identified for the academic year. And I'll share some of those on an upcoming slide. And then we have monthly in-person meetings that help us build community, educate ourselves and discuss sort of what's going on in the world of public health. And then finally, we have an annual retreat focused on planning for the academic year. So I wanted to share a bit about our how, so sort of like what we are up to, the topics that we focus on and how we do some of that work. So the topics that we focused on in the past and continue to focus on are really, in, they, they, they relate to the structural determinants of health essentially and sort of things at that level of public health. 
I'm not going to read these, but they're there on the slide for you to read. Um, we also, through our activities, um, you know, all of these are in alignment with our values and our mission as well. But some examples of our activities are things that align directly with our values, like protests, die-ins, written statements, vigils, and supply drives. We also do some policy work by writing APHA policy statements. We engage one another in collective learning through things like teach-ins and panel discussions. And then we disseminate our work and sort of what we're up to through conference presentations, as well as op-eds and other news articles and everything else that's listed on the slide too. And I'm not really going to read through much of these processes because I mentioned a lot of these already, but I think one thing that's really important to highlight is um, we're very intentional about collaborating with other organizations, especially folks who know more about certain public health topics than we do. We recognize we're not the experts on everything. And so I think that collaboration is really important to continue to collectively learn and also to share resources. Um, so I'll leave that here. You all will have access to these slides after. So I encourage you to take a deeper look at this if you're interested. This slide has a lot of words on it, so I'm definitely not going to read all of this, but this is another slide to take a look at after um, the Action Lab today. If you're interested in seeing specific examples of the work that we've done, um, we just wanted to highlight some of this in a timeline format. And then here are some sort of snippets in graphical form of what we've been involved in in the past. So. Again, feel free to take a closer look at this if you'd like to after the Action Lab. And as Yvette mentioned in her introduction, RPH has really been critical to the Epidemics of Injustice course. And we just wanted to sort of reaffirm and highlight some of our work around the course. So we've been involved in conceptualizing um, the initial implementation and the annual planning and implementation of the course since 2017. And that includes all the things listed in this bullet point. I'm not going to read them all, but, you know, just sort of at a high level, it involves, you know, determining who is going to actually like staff the course, who's going to be speaking and leading labs, promoting the course, finding funding, making sure folks know about the course and hear about the great work that it is. So um, it's really sort of a multifaceted role. And um, we've been really critical to making sure that this course continues in the school, which we're really proud of. And so on that note, we wanted to highlight some of our accomplishments. So since 2017, we've been able to double the number of lectures and action labs that we've offered. We've also doubled the number of overall registrants and roughly tripled the number of overall attendees at the session. So basically the class has grown tremendously, which we're also really excited about because that means more people are able to co-learn together and are hearing about this opportunity. Um, additionally, this year we've hired our first community facilitator, um, so that essentially means someone who is external to UIC, they don't actively work at UIC at this time. We're also offering Spanish interpretation for the first time this year, which is really exciting, um, and we continue to receive feedback about the positive impact of this course from you all and from folks who have attended in the past, and we also receive some constructive feedback, which we appreciate because I think we've been able to do a good job of incorporating that to continue make the, to make the course better. Um, and of course, we're bringing prospective students to UIC School of Public Health, which is really important. So, um, you know, we're always happy to talk to folks about what it's like to be a student at UIC in the School of Public Health. And we hope that this course maybe entices some folks to join that program. And then finally, our academic year 2024 priorities include planning this course, which is mostly planned now since it's actually live and being implemented. We also are taking action and will continue to take action to support local and national efforts against the genocide of Palestinians and the ongoing occupation as a public health concern. Um, we are involved in anti-apartheid week coming up and so stay tuned um, I believe that the instruction team will announce that on Blackboard and probably in sessions before and on the Google site so you all know when that is and how to get involved. Um, we plan to and are continuing to respond to emergent needs expressed by collaborators as our capacity allows, and that includes supporting the migrant and asylum seekers crisis. 
and we continue to connect and educate ourselves through monthly in-person meetings. So with that, I'll pass it over to Steph to introduce the root cause analysis. Thanks, Marjorie. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so like Marjorie mentioned at the beginning, I did want to go back to this Ella Baker quote um, that we started off with earlier, because I think it's really relevant to why we're doing um, the root cause analysis, why we're doing this exercise. So um, if you don't know about Ella Baker, um, I don't have time to, you know, go through um her work and her legacy, but I really encourage um, you to look her up and, and look up her work. Um, but essentially she was an activist or organizer um, is another word for that. And she talks about being radical as a means to actually changing the system, right? So before I go into explaining how this exercise actually works, I just wanted to preface with this point because we don't just want to do this activity as a discussion. It really is meant to prompt some action um, to address whatever issue that we decide to explore in the moment. So um, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so that leads us to why, right? What is a root cause analysis, or I'll just refer to it as an RCA. Um, and how do we use it? So an RCA is a process um, or a tool to identify the root causes of social issues and along the way identifying symptoms or problems that ultimately help us um, identify solutions to these social problems. And I'll talk about what is the difference between a root cause, what is a symptom, what is a problem, and what's a solution um, in one of the upcoming slides. Um, but RCAs are used in many fields of work, um, not just in public health. Um, it's used in community organizing and policy and advocacy work. So um, you may have seen an RCA before, you may have used one yourself. Um, and so if you have, I would be really interested to know um, in what ways you've used this tool. Feel free to put that in the chat if you've used it before. Um, but for RPH, we use the tool as a way to reflect on different public health issues that we're interested in as a group. And again, really to find actionable solutions um, to address the issues that we're interested in. So it really helps us not just sort of sharpen our critical thinking and our radical thinking, but it really um, helps us identify what are the different ways that we can address these problems. And so um, you can use this in, you know, for any particular issue that is happening um, in the current moment, or you can do it as sort of a regular exercise the way that um, RPH did, does. So it's, it's completely up to you. Um, you can go to the next slide. So here are the different definitions that you are going to need as we um, do this activity together. It's really important to be clear on what is an issue, what is a symptom and a problem, what is a root cause and what is the solution. So to start off, an issue is an overarching situation in a community that requires discussion to find solutions to address um, the different problems. So for example, an issue might be the opioid overdose epidemic in the US. It's a broad topic, right? Then we have symptoms and problems. These are easily visible and above the surface. So these are the conditions or results of the issue that we're observing. Um, and these can happen at both the community and organization organizational level. Um, so for example, increased fentanyl deaths in a particular neighborhood or increased criminalization or arrests of people who use drugs. Then we have root causes. A root cause is the underlying solution, excuse me, underlying source um, for creating, that creates problems, encouraging those problems to persist, even though there may be different interventions in place to help. So for example, a root cause of this particular example that we're using would be poverty, structural racism, community trauma, um, influence of pharmaceutical companies and underfunded harm reduction programs. And last, we have a solution. So solutions can be both short-term and long-term. Um, a short-term solution can provide immediate relief to the different symptoms and problems 
And a long-term solution, such as a policy intervention, really gets at the root cause of the issue that we're talking about. So we, we're going to demonstrate this for you um, in just a bit, but I have one last slide, if you could move along. Great, thank you. So how do we actually do an RC8? Um, like I said, we're going to demonstrate for you right now, but essentially what you're going to do is you're going to be put in a group. You're going to ask someone to be a note taker. So we're going to use Jamboard for this activity, um, and you're going to ask them to go ahead and fill out that Jamboard. Um, please make space for everyone to participate. So feel free to completely unmute or um, use the chat as needed. Um, you're going to go ahead and pick an issue. So we have developed a list of um, sort of some um, broad issues or topics that you can select from. Um, if you don't want to use any of those issues, you can feel, feel free to you know choose one yourself. Um, but then you're going to talk about this issue. You're going to discuss the different symptoms that lead to this issue. Hopefully you can get to root causes and then propose some solutions. It's totally okay if you don't get to all of the root causes and you don't get to all of the different solutions. Just do your best to try to fill in something for all of the different boxes. Next, um, I would encourage you to maybe um, agree to the guidelines that we shared earlier today. So... Um, for example, keeping confidentiality within the group, um, step ups and step back, for example. And then we're also going to share the definitions that I shared in the last slide right before that. If you are new to doing this exercise and you need a refresher on the difference between um, these different definitions. And last, before we go into um, the demo, I just wanted to give you some different considerations to keep in mind as you're doing this exercise. It is totally okay if you don't know everything and you don't know why something is happening. Um, please feel free to open up a tab and Google if you need some support um, to do that additional research to really get to the answer. You want to also acknowledge diversity within the group and allow for discussion. So, um, you know, folks may have different ideas about why something is the way that it is. And I just wanted to highlight this quote from the first session. If you joined us for the opening session with Dr. Murray, one of the key takeaways for me was really her call to action um, that she had, or one of her many call to actions that she had for us, which is to challenge ourselves to think differently um, than we usually do. And while we want to of course, acknowledge diversity and honor different perspectives and pe uh, people's different experiences. It's also really important to challenge maybe some of those preconceived notions that we have about why issues are the way that they are. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and ask the RPH folks to jump on our Jamboard. And Marjorie, if you could actually also share the screen for the Jamboard. And I'm gonna go ahead and facilitate um, our Jamboard session. Just give me one second to pull that up. No prob. Okay, do we have all our, oh, hey Tiff, I see you on. <laughs> Okay, so the group of us are going to essentially kind of demonstrate, do a little bit of role playing of what this might look like in your breakout rooms. Sorry, slow internet over here. <laughs> okay, no worries. Okay, here we go. It's loading, finally. All right, I think we're in business. Okay. Our page, folks, does everyone have this open on their end? I'm going to go ahead and do the typing for us. I can't see the actual... Um, Oh, there we go. There we go. It's just very slow. I don't know why. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> it's okay. Hopefully um, it'll update as I type stuff in there. 
Okay, so this is just one of the templates that we can use for root cause analysis. If you go on Google, you can find all sorts of uh, different templates that you can use, uh, but this is just the one that we're gonna use today. So we can he see here at the top left, we have our topic and we just decided on this topic um, so I think it's pretty easy. We can get through it pretty quickly. And then you can see in the boxes right under it, this is where we're gonna put our symptoms or problems from this topic. Um, you can see we have a space for organizational level topics and we have a space for policy level um, problems. At the bottom, we're gonna include um, different reasons why we think certain policies may be happening. And then on the top right, we have our root cause. Um, and then at the bottom, we're gonna put in our solutions. So um, since our topic is flu and COVID, um, identify the root causes of the increasing flu and COVID hospitalizations. Um, I think you could broaden it to hospitalizations slash cases in Chicago. So our PH folks, could we maybe start naming some um, problems or symptoms related to this topic? Feel free to unmute because I'm not looking at whoever's raising their hand. One thing that I've noticed is there's just sort of a general culture shift in how people are thinking about flu and COVID. So fewer people are masking, fewer people think it's important to get vaccinated, that type of thing compared to like the beginning of the pandemic. Totally. Okay, so I'm going to put that in here. Desinformación, Hilda Hernández. I'm hearing... Hilda that... Hernández, misinformation. Oh, okay, did you hear me? Also, what is happening is that now COVID, like we are so comfortable that we think that COVID does not exist and now workers are getting sick with COVID and they feel like as if nothing is happening. I, I, I heard misinformation and then I heard um, people getting more comfortable with sort of the protective measures that we're um, seeing. So maybe also like a lack of a perception of um, safety that maybe we're like out of the pandemic, quote unquote. Also, at least when it comes to COVID, like we've got pre-existing poor health um, and, you know, pre-existing disorders that make you more vulnerable to, um, to having COVID and to having worse experiences with COVID. Absolutely. We also had a, a chat message um, from a participant uh, saying that crowded living conditions in certain communities. Okay. I, I also want to mention um, work arrangements make it hard for some people to uh, be masked. And then the, the proximity of the person, especially like those in um, different healthcare settings or educational settings, I think also that's, kind of, oh, oh, before sorry. we move on, I just want to point out what Yvette just shared about work conditions. I'm going to go ahead and put that um, symptom in the organizational level because I think work is like a really broad um, sort of um, condition that we're seeing um, within this institution of, of work, right? Um, does anything else need to be shifted, RPH people? Maybe something we want to, this could actually go in the policy level as well, work conditions. I think, uh, Kai, Saida Martinez, I think lack of insurance. Okay, that's a, definitely a policy decision of health insurance. Cool. Anything else we want to put in here? We don't have to fill this out completely. Oh, Tiff, I saw you were about to unmute. Yeah, because there are just so many things that folks are contributing in the chat, and I know you probably can't see it. 
Someone yeah. said um, it's no longer regularly discussed in mainstream news sources as an ongoing issue, which I think that feels related to the conversation about like comfortability or like culture shift. Um, somebody also said um, that like basically like time of the year, like holiday time, people are traveling more, gathering together. Um, someone said poverty. Someone said lack of coverage for vaccination. Someone said lack of educational materials for communities. Um, and then someone said specifically for the policy level that the pandemic was declared over uh, and thus support, like financial support has ended. Okay. I think I caught some of those. Right. I was like, I was talking real fast. <laughs> I don't know that I can put all of those in there, but let's just take what we have right now. So what we wanted to do whenever we have, um, you know, some of these problems um, or symptoms laid out, we want to continue to ask ourselves, but why? So just as a regular exercise, just ask the question, why? Why is that? So let's take, for example, some of the symptoms that we have sort of at this top box over here. Can we discuss, um, what do we think is a good one? Perhaps, I like this idea of culture shift um, and, you know, these behaviors of less masking and less vaccination, because I think there's a lot of um, focus on individual behaviors, but let's ask ourselves maybe why that is. Um, so RPH folks, do we have idea about this particular one? Well, I would say, but why for the pushing more individual behaviors is because it's, it's an American ideal. Like it's, you know, it's, that's a part of the like the national culture what is the um can i clarify ask you to clarify what is the american ideal you're talking about individualism the idea that like mm -hmm. you, you gotta figure it out yourself do it yourself pull yourself up by your own bootstraps type of vibe yeah to that effect um i put in the chat that workplaces and schools don't have masks available anymore it's like on the onus of individuals to buy them or mask up if they think they need it yeah absolutely I think that has a lot to do with uh this this work conditions piece right at the organizational level so I'm just well, gonna pick one for the sake of time is it okay if I can just pick this idea around because I think the point that you brought up Tiff is really important individualism as an American ideal do we have ideas about why that Maybe why do we have this culture of individualism? Well, also, um, people don't believe in science. I think that's also like a cultural norm and, and they don't believe that COVID exists. Okay. And why that might why might that be? I think to relate to your question, Steph, about why is individualism an American ideal and how that yeah. connects to believing in science. So if it, COVID or the flu hasn't happened to one specific person, then they don't think it might it's going to happen to them. And I, I think individualism has been around a long time. Um, I can't remember the exact like roots of it, but I feel That's like okay. religion or society, political stuff. Um, so yeah. Yep. Racism. <laughs> there we go. Say, We're getting... gonna... Oh, go sorry. Ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Nope. I was going to say capitalism because I feel like that really pits everyone against one another and says like you're a winner if you, you know, make more money than, you know, your neighbor, than your family member. I don't know. I feel like it drives a lot of competition between people and then it just becomes about yourself more so. Yeah, so what I think what people are naming right now to me is sounding like, like root cause of, of some of these issues that we're talking about. So I went ahead and moved those over um, to the root cause box. Do we want to get... cosa que tenemos que considerar segregación. Something else that we need to consider is the segregation that exists in Chicago. We are not together. 
where communities that are maybe Latinos or black people might be together, but they don't communicate with each other. So segregation is another thing um, that is part of the roots of the violence and also roots of that that we're talking uh, regarding COVID because there is no communication among us and we need to get united to and be able to make changes and changes in policies. relevant, it's particularly to the Chicago context um, and how that affects the way that, um, you know, people's behaviors or um, disinvestment in different communities. So I'm going to add that here. Okay, so we are at time. We did not get to changes in the system, but I do want to um, get us into breakout rooms right now. Um, so I think if we have the different breakout rooms, we may start putting people in there, but so you'll be assigned a breakout room and then you'll have um, the instructions and the definitions that I shared earlier. Um, and if you just go through, click next and through the Jamboard, um, you will find a blank template for you and your group and you're gonna fill that out. Um, RPH people will be also in the breakout rooms if you need help or you have questions, we'll definitely be there. Um, to support. So I know there was a lot. We went through it pretty quickly, but have no fear. We will be in the rooms there to support and you have um, the instructions and definitions with you. Anything else, folks, before we put people into the rooms? Um, I'm just going to yep. interject oh. real quick. Um, well, two things. If you do only speak Spanish, um, put something in the chat. Um, I hope it's obvious. Translating this then. Um, so we know to put you in a breakout room with um, one of our facilitators who speaks Spanish. Also, if you have not selected a language channel yet, um, please do. You're not automatically put in one. Um, so that's why if you are hearing a classmate speak Spanish and not the interpretation over it, that's why you didn't hear it. Um, so please go to the bottom of the screen and select English or Spanish. Yeah, Marjorie. I just wanted to say before you join your breakout room, please note the number of the room. I always forget to do that. And then you won't know which Jamboard to go to unless you look at the breakout room number. So before you click join the room, make note of the number. And then at least one person in your group will know what number you are. Okay, looks like we do have a few Spanish only folks, so feel free to toss me in there. Sorry for the abrupt end and um, technical difficulties um, and not being able to screen share. Um, the, to start, Everyone, since we were in breakout rooms, everyone got um, out of their selected language channel. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and ask that everyone go back to the bottom of their, their screen, to the interpretation, pick the language you wanna listen in. Everyone has to select one. You're not automatically in one. Even if you speak both English and Spanish, you have to pick one. Otherwise, you will not hear um, your classmates or the interpretation. Um, and Sylvia, the interpreter, won't be able to go back and forth. Um, so Yvette, if you could say that in Spanish. Yeah. Um, uh, then... gracias, sí, gracias por participar en los grupos. Um, ahora, si quieren escoger español, tienen que meterse de nuevo a, al grupo de español. Le damos un momento para hacer eso, para que escuchen la traducción. Okay, so if hopefully everyone is in their correct language channel now, um, we're just gonna open it up for some general discussion. Um, 
if you were able to get the Jamboard open, definitely feel free to scroll through and see what other groups worked on. I think this is a really interesting activity. Um, and I was in group one, so I'll just very briefly share. We talked about the gender pay gap um, and we talked about how there's like companies don't have parent like parental leave or they don't want to promote women because they might have kids and become like a loss to the company and so then we talked about like federally mandated policies and changing the social norms about the value of child care and the roles of women and we got to the solutions and I think we we talked a lot about that um as well like how to we said some of the root causes were misogyny um, and white supremacy culture and the social norms that come with that, uh, like the nuclear family and individualism and things like that. Um, so if any other groups want to go through, we can go through one by one or if people just want to share out, if you don't want to talk about the topic and you just want to talk about your activity, if you've never done one of these before. There's well, also some mention in the chat, sorry, Allison, if somebody can share a screen. And, and maybe that way um, with the jam board and maybe that way people can talk through it if that's okay. I don't know if we'll have enough time for that since we only have about 10 minutes for reflection. So I think if folks could just summarize what they discussed at a high level and it doesn't even have to be each group because we really only have 10 minutes or so, unfortunately. I put the questions on the slide into the chat as well, but yeah, if anyone wants to share about the activity or something they learned. I will share my group talked about access to health and we talked about the barriers that we have in terms of uh, language, doctors that do not understand our culture. And we also talked about people that do not have documents and for them, it's very difficult to have access to health services. And also, people who work, um, who have precarious uh, and unstable jobs, determines um, the health status of people. So, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Dolores. That's that's a good topic. I I didn't get a chance to see what everyone else worked on. Ivy in the chat pointed out that multiple people had the same topic. So I'm definitely curious for folks who had the same topic, how many of us in different groups started to come to the same or similar conclusions in different breakout groups. Yeah, it looks like slides six, seven, and eight at least talked about homelessness and housing insecurity. So that's interesting. Would love to hear from some some of those groups, Neil, or correct me if that's not how you pronounce it. Oh no, Neil Neil is okay. Um, so I was in one of those homelessness groups, so this is actually perfect. But I think something that was really interesting is that like homelessness, um, kind of at a superficial level, people always think about money and affording, you know, housing. But I think it was it was really profound that our group really kind of talked about not just the economic factors, but also the social factors and even the political factors associating with homelessness. Um, it really just goes to show you that um, a lot of these issues, not just homelessness, but what other groups discussed are a lot more layered than um, we may have initially thought. So that, that was um, kind of really refreshing to have that kind of conversation in my group. And, and we're group six, and also um, with with home housing insecurity, it's um, an emergency, right? With the weather, um, and with what's happening with the migrant population and people being housed outside, that's why we kind of thought of it as like a priority issue. I was in group five um, and we kind of also talked about like beyond the economic impact or like issue behind the housing crisis, but also like stigma and how 
we view unhoused populations just generally as a population um and kind of like even things like tying health insurance to employment for example and that can lead people because you know um healthcare costs are so high and things like that that also have such a strong impact so and i think that also does affect the policy level as well Yeah, thank you all for sharing out. Any other thoughts? I'm scrolling through and I'm seeing quite a few groups pinpointed racism and capitalism as their root causes. Other thoughts about the activity? One thing you would change, something you learned? I think maybe one more comment. If anyone has one and then we'll move on so that we can get to our last thing uh, really. si hacer un comentario, perdón. yes uh, i would like to make a comment that maybe we did not have enough time because we wanted to, to continue to talk <laughs> thank you and also yeah. what dolores was saying is that we needed more time but i feel like a lot of people here are action-based people and i i can imagine that if we all came up with an issue, we would find some solutions. And then there's so many um, critical public health professionals or social justice advocates in this group that I'm sure we can have momentum. So I was really excited for um, everyone's eagerness to continue on. Yeah, that was really great. And I think I saw that the Jamboard will be posted. So in your spare time, feel free to comb through the work of all the other groups. But thank you for sharing out. And I'm going to pass it to Katie to talk about the shared dictionary. Thanks, Allison. Um, yeah, so this is going to be a tool we hopefully use throughout the semester and come back to. Um, this is a new idea. Um, and as we just saw, we often run short on time. Um, but the shared dictionary is hopefully a way to develop a baseline of language um, for public health topics um, because we know a lot of students come from different backgrounds and different knowledge, and different disciplines. Um, so we want to have that accessible to folks. Um, how this is going to function is there is a tab on the class site. You can either navigate that way or scan that QR code on the slide. Um, and that's where we'll have it available for people to um, view and check in with. Um, it's up now um, with some of our root cause analysis definitions, a couple others, and some words we know we want to add but haven't put the definition in yet. Um, and we really would love it, folks, during class time um, in the chat or after a lecture, before a lecture said, you know, this word I think would be good to add. Um, if we run short on time or you don't feel comfortable sharing in Zoom, there's also a Google form linked at the top of the, of the page on the website that you can fill out with the word definition you want to add and we'll uh, keep the, the doc updated. Um, so that is just that little intro. Um, and then to kind of close out for RPH's section, um, to learn more about radical public health and how to get involved, um, you can scan the Q QR code, visit our social media, and um, or send us an email if you'd like to be put on email list. Um, and that will um, wrap up our main session today. Um, another new thing we're doing is leaving the this main room open um, until 7.30 for uh, community members if you still want to chat. Um, the students taking the course for credit, um, we're going to be going into one big breakout room um, and starting at 7, um, we'll be going over the syllabus. So um, we'll be taking a break for the next nine minutes. Um, 
and then we'll transition to that breakout room, go through the syllabus, and end at 7.30. Um, Thank you, Katie. I, I also just want to reiterate that the space is open for all of us um, who want to stay, the community members. Um, we're encouraging you all to be a community of practice within ourselves. So please stay on if, if you feel in, inclined to. And this is something, um, uh, the root cause analysis can be something that you all continue to talk about um, in that group. And again, the students will join this other breakout room, but please stay on and remember that we have um, a great lecture next week too. And we just, let's just thank RPH as well for um, their instruction of, and taking us through the root cause analysis. And again, please join us next week. We have uh, David Stovall, Dr. David Stovall, and he has an amazing um, lecture with great content prepared for us. So we're in for a treat to learn from him. And, and connect again. So please stay on if you have time. Um, and for the students, we'll be joining another room, but please join us next week. If you have any questions, any trouble with any of the tech or getting on, please let us know. Um, but there'll be people here to um, be with you in the larger session. So thank you.